This video is a lecture on finding a confidence interval for a population statistic. In particular, we're going to be estimating the population proportion using a confidence interval. We'll estimate the population mean using a confidence interval when the population standard deviation is known. I'll be looking at estimating the population mean when we don't know the population standard deviation. And then also we're going to be investigating the sample size. So we're going to decide if we know how good an estimate we want, and we want a certain confidence interval, then what is the smallest sample size that you can use so that you're certain that you're going to have such a good estimate? So let's start out with some terminology. First, when I say the word point estimate. That means the best estimate or best guess for the population parameter using the sample data. So for example, we don't usually know the population mean, so we can use the sample mean as our best estimate or a point estimate for the population mean. The same can be said for the population proportion. We use the sample proportion as our point estimate for the population proportion. And we'll also often use the sample standard deviation as a point estimate for the population standard deviation. So next, the standard error. Now that came in in the central limit theorem, and we're going to specifically be using that when we're talking about confidence intervals. And if you remember, the standard error is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. It tells you how far off you're likely to be from the population parameter, such as the population mean, by using the sample parameter, such as the sample mean. Then the margin of error, that's the maximum likely difference between the observed statistic and the population parameter. It's very much related to the standard error, but we're going to have a confidence level and there's going to be a multiplier based on that confidence level to get from the standard error to the margin of error. So the confidence level, what that really means is the probability, we'll often write it as 1 minus alpha, that the confidence interval will contain the population mean. Or if you're dealing with population pr proportions, then it'll be the probability that the confidence interval will contain the population proportion. So if you have a 95% confidence interval, that means that if you were in the business of creating confidence intervals, and you have one after another after another, then you would have a 95% success rate in making sure that the confidence interval that you have computed actually does contain the parameter you're interested in. And then finally, the critical value is the value of z such that the area of the normal curve between negative z and z is 1 minus alpha. It's a little complicated. So for example, if you want a 95% confidence interval, then we know the inside is 0.95. So the outside will be 0 0.05. Half of that, just the left-hand side, will be 0.025. And then if we use the inverse normal distribution, inv norm on our calculator, you'll end up with a z value of negative 1.96. And I'll show you that a little later on the calculator on how to do that. And a positive z value of positive 1.96 on the right hand side. And that's a critical value. So now let's continue on. A 1 minus alpha confidence interval such as a 95% confidence interval, for the population parameter is an interval centered about the sample statistic, such as the sample mean, with width equal to twice the margin of error. So if many samples are taken from a population with the same sample size, then the proportion of the constructed confidence intervals that will contain the population parameter is 1 minus alpha. So it's like 
So again, what that says is that if you are doing confidence intervals over and over and over again, that's your business, and you looked at all the different 95% confidence intervals that you could make, the hope is that those intervals will contain the population mean or proportion if that's what you're interested in. So what we can say is that 95% of them will. So 95% of them you can think of as will be winners because you got what you wanted, you contain the population parameter, but then 5% of the confidence intervals that you could possibly create will be losers. So you blew it, it didn't contain the population parameters, and not really you blew it, but you just had bad luck. And in statistics, luck happens because you always have probability of something happening. So I'm going to show you in this lesson, I'm going to completely rely on the TI-83 and TI-84. And the way you compute a confidence interval for a mean is you go to stat, then tests, then you use one prop z in. You're going to have to scroll down pretty far for that. And then you press enter. X will be the number of successes. N will be the sample size. And C level, nothing to do with being near the ocean. That stands for the confidence level. Often it will be 95%, sometimes 90%, or there's some others like 99% you might use. And then finally, you hit calculate. And that will give you the confidence interval that you're interested in and sometimes some other information too. So now let's look at an example that will help us understand how to use a calculator, how to interpret the confidence level, how to interpret the confidence interval. So here's an example. A study was done to estimate the proportion of online college students who feel like they are enrolled in too many classes. Of the 150 students who were surveyed, 60 of them answered that they were, were, they were enrolled in too many classes. Determine a 95% confidence interval. Just a disclaimer, and this is a disclaimer of pretty much all my videos, I totally made up these numbers, but you can imagine a study might be done doing this. So this is just so that you can understand how confidence intervals work. So I want the numbers to be nice, so that's why I kind of made them up instead of giving you real data, which is messier. So what I like to do is I start out by writing down what I call my cast of characters. So I'm going to look at these numbers and see what the letters or the variables they correspond to. So first, 150 students, that's the sample size. So we could say n is equal to 150. 60 of them answered they were taking too many classes. So 60 is the number of successes. So we call that x on our calculator. So x equals 60. We want to determine a 95% confidence interval. With a 95% confidence interval, that 95% or 0.95, the calculator calls C level. So C level equals 0.95. So now let's go to our calculator and let's work this out and let's also interpret it. Okay, so here's my calculator and I want to get a 95% confidence interval and remember n was 150, x was 60, so I got a stat and then I hit my right arrow twice to get to tests and then I scroll down because this is a yes or no question, we're talking about proportions, we want an interval because it's a confidence interval. And also notice that NP, that's 60, that's the number of successes. And NQ, that's the number of failures and the number of no answers. That's 150 minus 60, which is 90. Those are both bigger than 5. So then it makes sense that I can use the normal distribution for this confidence interval. So what will work for us in this case, if I keep scrolling down, is one prop z int. One because we had one sample, one survey question. Prop because it was a yes or no question for portions. Z we know we're allowed to use because n, p, and n, q were both bigger than five. And int because we have a confidence interval. So I hit enter. And then it asks us, what is x? Well, x, if you remember, was 60. 
60 and enter. Then it asks, what is n? n is 150. So 150 and enter. And then sea level is 0.95. So I'm going to type in 0.95, even though it says it, just to remind myself, kind of force myself to focus and make sure that it's 0.95. Then I go down and I hit enter on calculate. And there's my confidence interval. Notice it also computes p hat, that's the sample proportion, which was 40%. Here's our n again, just to remind us. And our confidence interval is 0.3216 to 0.4784, or about 32% to about 48%. So here's how we interpret it. Remember, this was a question about the proportion of online students who felt like they were taking too many classes. And what we can say is that we are 95% confident that the proportion of students who think that they're taking too many online classes is somewhere between 32% and 48%. Notice this is a proportion of all students, the whole population. We might be talking about all of America. This is not refer just to the 150 people that were surveyed, we know their proportion. Their proportion was exactly 0.4. What we don't know is the proportion of all students in the whole country, probably. But we don't know what it is, but we can say we're 95% confident that that proportion is between 32% and about 48%. Now, the confidence level was 95%. Now, that tells us that if we looked at all possible samples of size 150, every time we took a sample, we would arrive at a different confidence interval, not this confidence interval, because we'd ask a different 150 American students. And each time we arrived at a different confidence interval, we can look and say, well, does that confidence interval contain the true proportion of all American students who are online who feel that they are taking too many classes. And what we can say is that 95% of those constructed confidence intervals that we could take contain the true population proportion, and 5% don't. So let's move on to another example, and let's go to the PowerPoint again. Okay, so here's the other example, and it says a biologist wants to estimate the proportion of Tahoe chicory squirrels that survive the winter. The biologist tagged 450 randomly selected squirrels in the fall. By spring, only 320 of them were still alive. Determine and interpret the 90% confidence interval for the population proportion. So notice first, this is a confidence interval for a population proportion because it's a yes or no question again. You ask that squirrel, hey, are you alive? And the squirrel is either alive or dead. So it's a yes or no, either you're alive or dead, you're not kind of alive. So this is a proportion, we want a confidence interval. So let's get our cast of characters, 450. That's the sample size because that's the number of squirrels that were tagged. So we can say that N is 450. 320, that was the successful squirrels, the ones that said, yes, I'm alive. So that was X is equal to 320. 90%, that's the confidence level. And if you remember, we call that C level on the calculator. So now let's go to the calculator and find our confidence interval. Okay, so here's the calculator. Again, I'm going to start with stat. I'm going to hit the right arrow twice to get to tests. Then I'm going to scroll down a lot until I find one prop Z int. So I'm almost there. And there's one prop Z int. One sample. We're talking about a yes or no question. Died or didn't die. And we're talking about Z. Notice again that the number of squirrels that lived was 320. That's NP. The number of squirrels that died that turns out to be 450 minus 320, which is 130, that's NQ. And both those numbers are bigger than five, so the Z is allowed. We're allowed to use the normal distribution. 
and we want an interval, confidence interval. So I hit enter. It asks us for x. In this case, x is 320. So 320. I hit enter. Then it asks us for n. n was 450. So 450. And I hit enter. The confidence level this time is 0 0.90. So I go 0 0.90. Hit enter. Hit enter again, uncalculate, and there's my confidence interval. Notice that it's about 0.68 to about 0.75. Notice p hat was about 0.71, that's the sample proportion. So we can say with 90% confidence that the proportion of the Tahoe chicory squirrels, that's all Tahoe chicory squirrels in all of the Tahoe area, not just the 450. So the proportion of all Tahoe chicory squirrels that survive the winter is between 68% and 75%. So interpreting the confidence level, we can say that had we taken many samples of size 450 Tahoe chicory squirrels and looked at the proportion of how many lived, survived the winter and constructed a confidence interval. Each of those confidence intervals would be different, but we would know that 90% of all of the possible confidence intervals that could be constructed with sample sizes n equals 450 would contain the true population proportion of all Tahoe chicory squirrels that survived the winter. So now let's check out how to find the sample size that we need. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so what the goal is here now is to determine the sample size. So what that means is that if you are designing a study and you want to construct a confidence interval, that's your goal is to get a confidence interval. You may not want your margin of error to be very big. You want to make sure the width of that confidence interval is pretty small, maybe 2%, maybe 3%, maybe 5%. So you'll know your confidence level. You'll know your margin of error that your goal is to be. Of course, you don't know the confidence interval yet because we haven't done the study. The question is, how many people or how many squirrels or whatever you're looking at, how many do you need to sample? So in other words, Let's find n. So first, if you don't know anything about the population itself, you have no guess at the population proportion, then the formula that we're going to use is that n is equal to 0 0.25, and then the z that corresponds to that confidence level squared divided by the square of the margin of error. On the other hand, if your goal is the same, but you do have an estimate, maybe from last year's study, or maybe just a gut feeling on what that proportion might be, you can actually get a smaller sample size that you need to deal with. And you don't want a big sample size because that's just a pain, it's a lot of work, it costs money sometimes. So you want a small sample size that you can have and still have a small margin of error that is satisfactory for your confidence interval. So if you happen to have a preliminary estimate, then the formula is going to be P, that's your estimate for the proportion of successes, times Q, that's the estimate for the proportion of failures. Notice that if you know P, you can get Q with the rule of complements by using 1 minus P. And then times the Z that corresponds to the confidence level, squared divided by the margin of error squared. So let's look at some examples. So let's suppose you want to perform a study to estimate the proportion of college students who receive financial aid. You want to construct a 95% confidence interval and you want a margin of error of no more than plus or minus 6%. So the question is how many people should you survey if you have no idea in advance what the proportion is? 
So what we're going to first have to find out, the hardest part about this whole thing, is coming up with that Z. And you find Z by, again, you have a 95% confidence interval. So that means that the middle 95%, that's your confidence interval. You want the Z that will enclose that middle 95% by using negative Z to positive Z. So if you remember, if the inside in between negative Z and positive Z is 95%, then the outside total will be 5%. The left-hand side will be half of that, which is 2.5%. Remember, 2.5% is not 0.25, it's 0 0.025. So I'm going to go to my calculator, and I want to find the Z that corresponds to the area under the curve to the left to be 0 0.025. So let's go to the calculator. So here's the calculator, and the way I find the area to the left of 0 0.025 is I go to second, distribution, and then I go to inv norm. Hit enter, and then I type in 0 0.025. I close the parentheses, and then I hit enter again. And notice it gives me about negative 1.96. Okay, so notice on the left side will be negative 1.96. Since the normal curve is symmetric, the right side will be positive 1.96. So let's go back to the PowerPoint, and we can look at the calculation. Okay, so here's the PowerPoint. And if you remember N, the formula for N when we don't know anything about what the proportion is, is going to be that 0 0.25 times, and our z we just found out in the calculator was 1.96. We square that. Our margin of error, remember 6% is not 0.6, it's 0 0.06. So we have divided by 0 0.06 squared. And I ran that in my calculator, and I got 266.78 about. One of the things about calculating n is it's always a good idea to round up. No matter what you get, you should always round up, even if it's less than 0.5 for that extra. So I'm going to use 267, and I can say that I should survey 267 people to estimate the proportion of college students who receive financial aid if I want to construct a 95% confidence interval with a margin of error of no more than plus or minus six percent. So now let's answer the same question, but let's suppose that last year the college found out that 30 percent of all college students receive financial aid. So now the question is how many should we survey? So notice we now have a preliminary estimate for the population proportion and that's 0.3. So I can use our formula with preliminary estimate, and that means that we take P, which is 0.3, times Q, which is 1 minus 0.3, which is 0.7, times our Z, the same Z we calculated for a 95% confidence interval, and that was 1.96. We square that number, and then divide by E squared, or 0 0.06 squared. I got 224.09, remember I round up, and I get 225. Notice that's pretty much less than 267. So it saves us some effort if we have this preliminary estimate. Sometimes you know it from last year, sometimes what you do is you just survey maybe 20 people to get a quick little estimate and use that. In this case we had last year's data. Okay, so let's move on. I want to talk about the effects on a confidence interval. So first thing, the formula for a confidence interval is x bar plus or minus that z that we calculated times the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. That's when you have a confidence interval for a sample mean. With a sample proportion, it's similar, but instead of x bar, you have a p hat, and then you don't have a sigma, but there is a kind of a root n-ish on the denominator, a little more complicated. But because of that, we can say the same thing whether we're talking about 
proportions or means when it comes to the sample size. Now, for the standard deviation, there's no standard deviation for a proportion. So we can say just from this formula, if sigma gets smaller, then this piece, the right-hand side of the plus or minus, that's a margin of error, by the way. So if sigma gets smaller, we're decreasing the numerator. So the margin of error will also decrease, which means the width of the confidence interval decreases. And that's a good thing. You want to have a narrower confidence interval. If n increases, that's in the denominator. So since n is in the denominator, increasing n is going to decrease this fraction. So increasing n decreases the margin of error and the width of the confidence interval. That's a good thing. So a larger sample size gives you better precision, that you're more likely to get a confidence interval that's very, very close to the sample mean when you have a larger n. You're going to get a very narrow confidence interval. If you decrease the 1 minus alpha, so let's suppose that instead of 95%, use a 90%. So if you think about that, what that does is that means that we're going to only have a 90% confidence. So the area in the middle is going to be smaller. And that means that z value is going to be closer to 0. And if the z value is closer to 0, then that means that this guy right here is smaller. So the margin of error will also be smaller. So decreasing 1 minus alpha, for example, 95% goes to 90%, decreases the critical value, and thus it decreases the margin of error, and it decreases the width of the confidence interval. So here's an example with finding a confidence interval for a population mean. So every year, UC Davis measures the clarity of the lake, Lake Tahoe. Based on historical data, the standard deviation of clarity throughout the year is 1.6 meters. Suppose that in 2010, the Davis researcher took 35 measurements and found the mean depth of clarity to be 21.7 meters. Find a 95% confidence interval for the average depth of clarity of the lake. So notice this survey question is not a yes or no question. This time, you're going to take that measurement and you're going to say, how deep were you able to see below the surface? And an answer might be, ah, I could see 25 meters below the surface. Notice it's not yes or no. We're talking about means and standard deviations here. Also, our sample size was 35. Since 35 is bigger than 30, that means I'm allowed to use the normal distribution for my calculations. So let's go through our cast of characters, 1.6. Notice this is a standard deviation, but it's not any old standard deviation. This is a standard deviation for the entire year. We're assuming that we just know that, which isn't very likely, but I want to do that just to make life a little easier for us, is that if we know the population standard deviation, so that means sigma is 1.6. 35, that was the sample size. So n is 35. 21, that's the mean, and it's the mean for the sample, so that's an x-bar. x-bar is 21.7. And then finally, 95% is the sea level. So now let's go to our calculator and come up with our confidence interval. So here's the calculator. I'm going to go to stat. I go to tests. So right arrow twice. Now I'm talking about a mean. So I'm going to go for what's called a Z interval. That's number seven on the calculator. Z because our sample size was large enough, but really more importantly, it's not because of the size of the sample this time. Here it's because we know the population standard deviation. And that's what's going to determine using Z. Interval because we want a confidence interval. So I hit enter. Now, 
if you know the data, if you know all of the data values, then we're going to click data and then probably put it into L1 and use this. But we don't. So I'm going to go and hit the right arrow and go enter for stats because we're given statistics. I go to the down arrow. Sigma, if you remember, was equal to 1.6. 1.6. And hit the down arrow. X bar was equal to 21.7, 21.7, down arrow. N was 35, so 35, and then down arrow. And the C level, confidence level was 95%, or 0.95, or 0.95. I use a down arrow. And I hit enter on calculate. And here it is. We have our confidence interval. 21.17 to 22.23. So we can conclude, we can be 95% confident that in the year 2010, throughout the whole year all over the lake, not just the measurements we took, but everywhere every day, the mean clarity was between 21.71 meters and 22.23 meters. Okay, let's interpret the 95% confidence level. So what that means is that if we had done a different sample of 35 measurements, and then another of 35 measurements, and another and another and another, we did that maybe millions and millions and millions of 35 measurements throughout the year, each one of those samples of 35 measurements would end up producing its own confidence interval, a different confidence interval. Not 21.17 to 22.23. It would be different from that. Some of those confidence intervals will actually contain the true mean depth of clarity throughout the year, and others won't. The proportion that will contain the mean depth of clarity is 95%. Okay, let's look at another example. Okay, here's another example. It says a restaurant owner wants to estimate the mean amount of money her customers spend at her restaurant. She knows that the standard deviation is $6.42. She looks at 50 randomly selected receipts and calculates the mean of these receipts to be $43.71. Determine and interpret the 90% confidence interval for the mean. So once again, we know the population standard deviation. That's probably not really going to happen in the real world, but just for this example, we're going to say that's true. This again is not a yes or no question. The question is, look at the receipt. How much did that customer spend? And it might have been $44. So that's a mean and not a proportion. So let's look at our cast of characters. 642, again, that's a population standard deviation. So sigma is 6.42. 50 is the sample size. So n equals 50. 43.71 is the sample mean. So x bar equals 43.71. We want a 90% confidence interval. So the C level is 0 0.90. Now let's just go to our calculator. So here's the calculator. I hit stat, I hit the right arrow twice, and then I want Z interval. I'm just going to type 7, that will get me right to the Z interval. I do want stats because that's what I'm given. And then I go down, and sigma in this case, if you remember, was 6.42. So 6.42, I hit enter. X bar was equal to 43.71. So 43.71. Go to the down arrow. N was 50. 50. Enter. And the C level this time was 0.9. Not 0.95, but 0.9. So 0.9. I go down. 
hit enter on calculate. And there we have it. Here's the confidence interval, 42.217 to 45.203. Since this is money, it makes sense to use two decimal places. So let's interpret it now. So now again, we're not talking about the 50 customers anymore. We're talking about all customers who could ever go to her restaurant. And we can say that we're 90% confident that the mean amount of money that all customers who could ever go to her restaurant spend is somewhere between $42.22 and $45.20. And notice that if she looked at a lot of different samples of 50 receipts, then 95% of the confidence intervals that would be produced from those samples would contain the true population mean expense for her customers. So now let's continue on and let's find out what happens when you don't know the population standard deviation, which is more likely. Very rarely do you actually know a population standard deviation because we don't have a census. So if we don't know the population standard deviation, we have a problem. The problem is that the z-score formula involves a population standard deviation. And the z-score formula, you may not have noticed, but that actually is part of the calculation for the confidence interval. You need sigma. If you don't know sigma, you can't do it. So the problem is we're stuck. But what we can do instead is we can use the sample standard deviation. The problem with that, though, is that the sample standard deviation is not the population standard deviation. So there's going to be an additional error that is going to be added if we use the sample standard deviation instead of the population standard deviation. And when we have that error, there's an adjustment to the error. And we put that adjustment in looking at that critical value. Instead of using Z, we're going to use something called T. And it's called the student's T distribution. The distribution has an additional parameter which we call the degrees of freedom. And you calculate that by taking n minus 1. So if your sample size is 100, your degrees of freedom is 99. The calculator will do all that for us, but it's good to note. And then everything else looks exactly the same. Even the distribution, although it's not normal, it's not that far off from looking normal. It is somewhat mound-shaped. It's unimodal. It's symmetric. The difference is it's a little bit taller at the end. In order to use the student's t-distribution, either you have to know that your distribution of the population is normal, which is pretty rare to know that, or you have to have a sample size larger than 30. Usually you can get a large enough sample that you can make that happen. So if that does happen, you can use a t-distribution. So let's take a look at an example. So let's suppose a study was done to estimate the mean age when people buy their first new car. The mean age of purchase for the 32 randomly selected people was 22 years old. And the standard deviation was 3. Determine and interpret the 95% confidence interval for the mean. So here we have 32 people. The important thing to note here is that this number 3 this standard deviation 3 refers to the 32 randomly selected people, not to the entire population of all people who buy their first car, but to the sample. So 3 is a sample standard deviation. It is not the population standard deviation. It's S. It's not sigma. So when we write down our cast of characters, 32 is still N. That's the sample size. 22 is still X bar. But 3 now is S, our sample standard deviation. And then 95% or 0.95 is our C level. So let's go to our calculator and see how all that works. Here's the calculator. And I'm going to go to stat, right arrow twice. And notice we do not want a Z interval this time because we cannot use the normal distribution. We have to use a T distribution. But the calculator comes to our rescue. It has the t interval. So I'm going to go to t interval, hit enter, 
I have statistics, not data. And since I have statistics, I'm going to go down. And my X bar was 22. 22. And use a down arrow. Notice even the calculator is smart enough to write down S and not sigma. Our S was 3. So let's write down 3. Go down arrow. Our sample size, N, was 32. So 32. Enter. Our C level was 0.95, a 95% confidence interval. So 0.95. Down arrow. And then hit the enter on the calculate key. So we now have our T interval. Notice it's between 20.918 and 23.82, or about 21 to 23. So we can conclude by saying that we are 95% confident that the true population mean for all people age at which they buy their first car is between 21 years old and 23 years old. So the same idea with confidence level. If we wanted to interpret that, we would say that if we did many studies, each with sample size 32 people, then each of these studies would produce its own individual confidence interval. Not this one, but its own unique confidence interval. 95% of those confidence intervals would contain the true population mean age at which people buy their first car. And 5% wouldn't. Those would be the losers. So now let's finally find out what happens if we want to find out the sample size, but it's no longer a proportion question. It's a question that involves quantitative data. We're looking at a confidence interval for the mean. So let's look at one more example, because these are so important because you almost never know the population standard deviation. And let's go to the PowerPoint. So this example says a study was done to estimate the mean blood alcohol level for customers at the casino tables. The 25 randomly selected table players had a mean level of 0.09 and a standard deviation of 0.024. Determine and interpret the 95% confidence interval for the mean. Assume the distribution of the table player's blood alcohol level is approximately normally distributed. Notice we need to make that assumption because our sample size was only 25. And with the sample size of only 25, we really can't do any of the computations unless we know that the distribution is normal. So also note that this 0.024 refers to the 25 people. It's the sample standard deviation for the sample of 25 table players. It's not the population standard deviation. So let's get our cast of characters. N is 25, because that was a sample size. 0 0.09, that is the sample mean, X bar. 0 0.024, again, that's a sample standard deviation. So that's S equals 0 0.024. And then 0 0.95, that's our C level. So let's go to our calculator. So here's the calculator. I press stat. I go to tests. Again, we don't know the population standard deviation. We have a quantitative question. This is a T interval which is number 8. I'm going to scroll down to it. You could also hit 8, but I like scrolling to make sure I'm in the right spot. And then hit Enter. I'm interested in statistics, or I have statistics. I don't have data. So I go to statistics x bar. If you remember, it was equal to 0 0.09. So 0 0.09. Hit the down arrow. The S was 0 0.024, 0 0.024. Our N was 25, so 25. 
And the sea level was 95%, so I can leave that there. But I hit enter on calculate. And here it is. We get about between 0 0.08 and 0 0.10. So we can be 95% confident that the mean blood alcohol level of all people who are at the casino tables is somewhere between 0 0.08 and 0 0.10. So similar with the confidence level, I'm going to let you figure that out. That's a little less important than interpreting the interval. So I'm going to stick to just the interval. So then finally, let's look at a sample size calculation when we're talking about a population mean instead of a proportion. Okay, so here's the question. Suppose that you want to conduct a study so that you can construct a 90% confidence interval for the mean number of physical therapy visitations a patient needs after receiving ACL surgery. You want the margin of error to be no more than 0.5 visits. If you know the standard deviation is four visits, how many patients must participate in this study? Notice the survey question is, how many visits did you have? And the answer is not yes or no, it's a number. So we want to determine the sample size, but we're talking about confidence interval for a population mean now. So the formula for that turns out to be n is equal to z for that confidence level times sigma over e quantity squared. So sigma we know that is the four visits. The e is the 0.5. This z that's the hard part that we got to find the z that corresponds to a 90 percent confidence interval. If 90 percent is between negative z and z that means 10% is outside that area. So that means that 5%, half of the 10%, 5% is to the left of that value negative z. So I could use my calculator again with inverse norm or inv norm. So let's do that. So here's a calculator. I go to second distribution. I scroll down until I get to inv norm. Hit enter. And remember, we wanted 5% to the left of negative z. So I do 0 0.05. Close the paren. Hit enter. And I get negative about 1.645 or so. Okay, that's the negative z. The positive z is positive 1.645 because of symmetry. So now I'm ready to finish the problem and do the calculation. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. All right, we're back to the question. And again, we know z, we know sigma, we know e, and we're ready to go. So what I got was that z, remember, was about 1.645. If you use negative, it doesn't matter because we're squaring it. Sigma is 4, and e is 0.5. And I put that in my calculator, and I got 173.19. Always round up. So what we say is that if we want to have a 90% confidence interval with a margin of error of no more than 0.5 visits, we need to survey at least 174 patients. So that's all I have to say about confidence intervals for this video. I want to thank you again for listening and make sure that you look at it a few times. Get some help if you're confused about any of this. Either for me if you're around, send me an email, I'll drop by if you're one of my students, or from your own instructor. Again, send that person an email, drop by, and uh, get some help. So thanks for coming and thanks for watching this whole video, and I'll see you in another video.